Good morning. Good morning. How many of you got up this morning and said, I'm going to go to church? Me. <laughs> All of you were wrong. You are the church. Yeah. This is the building where the, we gather. And we get to meet this Sunday morning with billions of other Christians who make up the church who are worshiping this morning. Doesn't that feel good to be part of a big body? Yeah. We may be few here, but we are enough because God said only four, two or more are gathered. Yes. So, all of you are wrong. You are the church. We do come here to gather, though, and worship. And I'd like to, like to uh, just ask you to pray with me for a moment. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together, Lord. We thank you for what went on in this building yesterday, Lord, and all the kids that uh, had smiles and learned a lesson, Lord. And we just praise you for the help that was here to make that happen, the kids that were here, the people who prayed for that event to happen. And Lord, the same way we're praying for this morning, Lord. We're here to worship you. We're here to thank you for what you've done for us, for the Savior that you sent to us, Lord. And I just ask that you be with us this morning to help us to come together as the church in this place and at this time to worship. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. We may be few, but I think stand up and we're going to sing some Christmas carols here. Thank you. 
Cut it out, you too. We have Celebrate Recovery. The meeting itself is from 6 to 7.30, but we do meet at 5.30 for dinner. So if you want to join us for that. And then we have um, holiday service times for this week. On Christmas Eve, we'll do a candlelight at 5 p.m. And that will be here at this location. Is that correct? And then um, will that be streaming online as well? Yes. Okay. That will be online. And then um, that would also be a great time to invite friends and family and uh, do the candlelight celebration. And then on Christmas Day, we'll be meeting at 1030. Um, there will be no small groups in the morning. And now we're going to show you a little bit of a review from our gingerbread bash last night, which was a lot of fun. I think we've got a few pictures. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, the kids were so creative. Yeah, Michelle. <laughs> and Michelle did a great job of telling the story. That was really nice. And we are going to start in January a new sermon series called Draw the Circle. We do have one book left in the back right now. Those are $5. If you want to order it yourself um, online, the new order won't be here until mid-January to get the $5 books here. But if you want to order it ahead of time yourself, you can go ahead and do that. And then um, we just want to let you know we are a church of prayer. And after we do uh, a couple more worship songs, our prayer partners will come to the front. So if you have a prayer need or you want to pray for someone, or maybe you just want to praise God for something good that he's done in your life, come on up and share that. And then um, if you have a prayer need and you're online, you can chat with us and um, we can pray for you. And we do want to mention that Elena and Richard's little one-month-old uh, granddaughter uh, does have RSV. And uh, her name is Isabella, so we want to pray for her. Um, Elena says she did do a, a turn for the better last night, so that's really it. Praise God. And um, now I believe Mark is going to come up and pray for our offering. Father, we just thank you that we get to worship you through tithes and offerings, Lord. We're giving back to you what you already own. Just probably pray you bless the giver and the gift and that you direct it to be used according to your kingdom's purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
this verse just kept sticking out because we just practiced this song Thursday night and it's changed my heart, oh God. Yet you desire, surely you are sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me, yet you desire faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in the secret place. Cleanse me with this, but I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your praise from my sins and blot out all of my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. The Lord, our, the Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. God of hope, God of peace, God of joy, and God of love. Teach us how to love one another as reflections of your light in the world. God of promise, God of love, into our darkness come. Amen. Amen. They knew the Messiah would come. I was like, 
he's here, he's here, let's go, let's go. <laughs> they packed up their camels, they wrapped up their gifts, their precious treasures of frankincense, gold, and myrrh, gifts fit for a king. These wise men would ride their camels across the endless deserts, up the steep mountains and down the deep valleys, through the raging rivers. They would travel across the grass, the grass seagull plains, night and day, day and night. Turned into weeks, it turned into months, perhaps even years, until finally, at last, they made it to Jerusalem. They thought here, surely in God's city, they would find the Christ child here in Jerusalem. He would be found. Oh, but we know that King Herod didn't like the sound of that new king being born. He didn't want anything to do with a new king. But Herod's advisors told the wise men that it was written that a baby king would be born in Bethlehem. And so these wise men loaded up again and followed the star six more miles to the little town of Bethlehem. The story of the Magi stirs our hearts to look beyond our familiar surroundings and remember that is the joy to bring the gospel to all nations for the glory of God. We want to be a part of what God is doing as he continues to draw Men, women, children, yesterday walked through these doors mm -hmm. to hear the Christmas story that he came. It's just not all about Santa Claus. The baby came in a manger, and they felt, they felt, felt God as they walked through the doors. We were able to show him his love. We as all nations come to worship the Son. Amen? Mm -hmm. yeah. Psalms 86, 9 says, all the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name. What promise do you see in that verse? What reassurance does the story of the Magi coming from the other parts of the world about spreading the news to others today? A few weeks ago, my granddaughters uh, stayed with us, and it was time to clean up and take that bath before bed, you know? And Autumn, uh, the Sam's five-year-old, the middle child, the one that's full of spunk, you know, the one that's got to have all the heart. And uh, she wears her feelings on her sleeve, and she tells you right what she's telling when her face, you know, whether she likes it or she not, because she doesn't like it. But she immediately gathered up all her treasures for the bath. The, the dolphin, the blue dolphin, and where's this, and, and where's the princess washcloth, the one with Elsa on it, all of these precious things that she <laughs> likes to take to the bath. She gathers up and is on her way. She says boldly and proudly, Grandma, I love you. And off she went. <laughs> and it was just such a simple thing, but with all her treasures, with all her love, she was marching off. And that's how I vision the visit of the wise men. With their love and their delight, they rode across the deserts and the plains and up the mountains. And here, almost probably two years later, they knocked at the door to the surprise of Mary and Joseph. And here stands the delegates from a far country. Their faces are kind, they're eager, their eyes are bright and reverent. But what an incredible sight as the three men knelt before the little king, perhaps taking off their own turbans, their own crowns, as they bowed before the child. We can imagine the first visitor stepping forward, opening a small treasure box of gold, maybe it was a large one, we don't know, but the most precious metal of all, a gift fit for the king, a gift of gold demonstrating that the heart of sacrifice. After all, these wise men had sacrificed much on their journey, on their long travel, to see this king. The little treasure box of gold closed again, and then another, the second step forward, opening this time a small vial. The aroma of frankincense filled the room. This holy oil reminded one immediately of the temple. As a cloud of fragrance, Bread. It suggested the pure and beautiful presence of God. 
If gold was a gift that said kingship, frankincense said godliness. Joseph and Mary may have trembled at the aroma of the temple being in their very own humble home. Then came the third and final gift. As it was, it was open, Mary may have felt a foreboding shudder. The aroma of the temple was now covered by the smell of myrrh. Myrrh, too, had a familiar association. Myrrh was an anointing oil used for embalming the dead. The final smell associated with the loss of a loved one. It was a scent of bereavement. The Magi brought it, too, because it was a precious oil, a valued gift in any land. The day would come when Jesus would be offered this gift of myrrh again, but at this later date, he would refuse it. Mark 15 tells us they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. They offered him a drug, wine drug with myrrh, but he refused it. Then the soldiers nailed him to the cross. He made a gift of himself to all of us. This child was a new kind of king. Though he was the prince of heaven, he became poor. Though he was the mighty God, he became a helpless baby. This king hadn't come to be the boss. He had come to be a servant. This servant king came to rescue us by his gift of great love. And this is our hope and prayer this morning, that everyone who walks through those doors and into this building, that everyone in this community feels and knows this great, of, great gift of love through us, and then by extension of us, the gift God has for them. The Bible tells us in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This greatest love is a sacrifice one's life for another. The greatest type of love is to sacrifice one's life for another. And that's how Jesus loved each of you and each of you watching online. He gave his life so you could live. Romans 8, 58 tells us, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died while we were still sinners, before we got it, before we had our act together, before we had things all figured out. We read the words in John 13, the precious words, that will describe Jesus in conversation with his disciples during that last supper that they would have together. Jesus knows that he will be betrayed. Jesus knows that he will be arrested and murdered. Jesus knows this is the last time that he can talk to his close friends. And in this moment, that extra weight to the precious words that Jesus is going to say that he's knowing that he's going to the cross within just hours. And in John 13, starting in verse 34, Jesus says these words. A new command I have given you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. If you love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus repeated it several times, and so do I, as we see, because the trap from immediately after this is spoken, through centuries of the church, if, we do, if we're not careful, we will insert something else to that space. We will let something else define us. We'll expect something else to show up the world. But Jesus says, by this, the way you love one another, not by anything else, not by how right you are all the time, not by showing up on a Sunday morning in your Sunday best. And if we're not careful, we will try to answer it with something else. We will try to say, certainly this is how to show people Certainly how this is the way 
people will know. But Jesus is always reminding us. Jesus is always taking us back. If you love one another. That is how the world will know. That's how the world will see what I'm like, what I'm all about, if you love one another. And then he says these great words, and then he goes to the cross. Love goes to the cross. Jesus said, love one another, and now let me show you how. Let me show you how. Jesus takes that love, and he goes to the cross, and he dies for the thief on the one side, the one that recognizes that he is an innocent man. And he dies for the thief on the other side, the one that mocks him right along with everyone else. He demonstrates that incredible love for those who are his best friends and for those who would spit in his face and murder him. He shows that love to us all. And in doing so, when God loves his enemy, he challenges us to also do the same. And that is hard. But that is how the world will know. The world knows if I hit you, <laughs> you're going to try to hit me back. <laughs> the world knows if I'm mean to you and I'm kind to you, you're probably going to act the same way. But the world thinks a different way than God. God turns that upside down and says, my kingdom is different. My way is different. They'll see it. They'll know it. They'll feel it. Something is different here. And may that something different be God's love that we share and we show to all. Amen? Amen. Amen. Culture is getting more and more polarized every single day. It feels like that we have something different um, and we pick an issue, whatever the issue is. You'll have two sides, right? And they're going further and further apart, yelling, taking sides, and there's no kindness. There's no gentleness. There's a lack of humility. We have to see the fruits of the Spirit. They have to see, the world has to see the way of Jesus. And I pray that is how people will remember me. Long after I leave this world and step in to the next, that I was someone who loved people well. That is my hope for you. That you will remember that you love people well. My hope for us as Christ followers, that we would be known how well we love people. I know that we all fail and in times in life, but I pray that we never fail at this, at loving people well. Our bank accounts can go up and down, but I pray our love will always be full. First John 4 encourages us in the same way. First John 4, 11, starts out, says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Pick it up in verse 12. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. What a beautiful picture. What an amazing truth for the world to feel and experience. And what an amazing honor that people could see God to us. That's amazing. What a privilege and responsibility that we can't take lightly. But did you catch the last point? If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Complete in us? <coughs> How could God's love possibly be incomplete? What is this even saying that his love is made complete in us? Here's the idea. God's love that has existed since the beginning of time, God's love that is demonstrated so fully in the person and in the life of Jesus Christ, God's love becomes complete, becomes the way God designed it and intended it to be when it lands in our own hearts, when it's redeemed and transforms our hearts in obedience so other people can now see it, feel it, touch it, experience. And in doing so, they experience what God is like. His tremendous love for them, 
His love becomes complete in this way. When we, the church, embody God's love in the world. Amen? When people experience you and me and they say, Oh, I get it. That's God? That's God's love? What a privilege that is. And we pray that they are drawn closer to him. We pray that the people that walked through the door yesterday in our simple gesture of making gingerbread houses and giving gifts, they go, oh, that's God's love? That's what he's like? I can feel that. He cares about me. He loves me. He knows my name. Jesus' last words before he goes to the cross are an invitation, a command to love. His last words before he leaves this earth and returns to the Father are a command to go. And as we celebrate his birth, his first coming, we recognize why he came, because of his great love. In just a few months, we'll celebrate Easter, his death, birth, burial, and resurrection. And after rising from the dead, he appears to his disciples and friends, and before he ascends to heaven, he gives them the invitation to go. In Matthew 28, there's a beautiful passage of scripture, a foundation through our church history, so much so we have a name for it, the Great Commission. It's before Jesus steps from this earth into his Father's presence, he tells you and I. Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And before we even move on, just stop right there and catch that. Don't miss that. The faithful obedience. They go to Galilee. They show up on the mountain. Jesus had told them to go. And so they went. And of course, Jesus will meet them there. Because he always does what he says. Verse 17 when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Go. Go. And even as he is going, Jesus invites us to once again follow his example. Jesus says, I am going, but that's not bad news. In fact, I'm inviting you to go too. Because if God's love is made complete when we experience and we live out his love, then there's an incomplete world that needs to be made whole. God's love is made whole, complete in us. There's an incomplete world out there that needs to be made whole, that needs to know, that needs to hear, that needs to feel, that we, brothers and sisters, can't just stay inside the walls here, that we just can't stay in the walls of our home. We have to go out and show the world his great love. Mm -hmm. Who Jesus is. You know the little song, Hide It Under a Bushel? No. <laughs> yeah, let Satan blow it out. No, we've got to shine our light into the world Amen. to go. Amen. There are people that we meet every day on the street, in the store, in the school, even in our homes. Lost people who need to know and feel the love of Jesus. Who will go? Who will tell them? Who will show them God's great love? I'm so thankful that Praise Church is a church that goes. Amen. Amen. We go out to the community. And that can be scary at times, but God is with us whether we walk across the street, walk across the office to show someone God's love and invite them to the way to know God. We're thankful that Jesus demonstrated his love on the cross. And before challenging us to pick up our own cross, so thankful that Jesus tells us, surely I am with you always, no matter where we go, even to the ends of the age. Which brings us to our last point, Jesus always goes ahead. Aren't you glad? We don't have to be scared to go. For God calls us because Jesus always goes first. 
He always goes ahead to the cross to show us the power, to the love to prepare a place for us, to demonstrate why we go so the world can join him in eternity. In our story in Matthew, Jesus isn't abandoning his friends. He's going with a purpose to prepare a place for you and me and all of those who love God. Jesus goes with a purpose, and then he gives us a purpose to go as well, to make disciples and demonstrate God's love to the world. Jesus always goes ahead. He loves you and I so very much. He will always clear the way. God loves you so much that he will show you where to go, which way to step, left or right, the path to follow. God is always, always, always with you. The greatest act of love in all human history was God taking on human flesh and being born in a Bethlehem's manger as Jesus Christ, he ultimately goes to the cross and dies there for our sins. Jesus goes ahead and invites you and me to follow him. Will you love another like Christ does? Can we say yes? Can we love others like Christ does? As we gather with our family and our friends, and those are not always easy situations, can we love them? as Christ does. We serve a mighty God that loves you so very much. He's offering his help. He's offering life. He's offering growth. And this Christmas, for the first time, I can't reach out, pick up the phone, and call my earthly father. But let me remind you, if we're too busy to stop and show love to a friend or even a stranger, we are too busy. Let's choose to let love be the strongest force. In 2023, the Lord willing, we will learn together. We will learn how to lean into his presence. We will learn how to draw a circle around a prayer need, lock shields together. As mentioned in the announcements, January 1st, we will start the new sermon series on prayer, a 40-day journey on prayer. Some of you may want to add fasting to that. So on January 1st, we'll start the new uh, prayer journey and learning how to pray together. I can't wait. I'm looking forward to that. As we close, I would love to invite you to remember our Christmas Eve candlelight service on the 24th. That will be right here at 5 o'clock. I know you all may not be able to come, but if you can, we would love to have you join us. Christmas Day, we'll be right there at 10.30, um, again with no small groups. So as we uh, close in prayer, our prayer is that, Heavenly Father, I ask, Lord, that you would continue to show your mighty little church how to shine your love, God. That we would be a bright spot, Lord, not even in our community, but in our families as we walk down the street, God that you will continue to show us how to love people well. Yes. Even when it isn't easy, even when it costs us something, a great sacrifice of humility or of, of resource or of time, help us to love well as you showed us, as you demonstrated. God, I ask that you would be with my friends this week, Lord, as they gather with their family, Lord. May your presence be the strongest force in the room. As we laugh together, as we eat together, as we open gifts together, may we be reminded of your greatest gift, your gift of love that you gave us. In your mighty name, in the mighty name of Jesus, we praise you. We worship you today. We exalt your name. We thank you, and we love you. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah, we, uh, we can pull Santa's going to sing us out. <laughs> so, uh, I thank you. Um, we'll, we'll All right, we'll see one more. Let's stand up and join them.
but we had a great God that, that sent his son to die on us, to grow up here and to die on the cross for us. And we're going to sing, Great Are You, Lord.